Cladistics is this process of grouping organisms based on common ancestry into what's called a clade. So a clade is a special term that we're going to use and it means something very specific. A clade is a group of organisms that includes the ancestral species, so whatever the most recent common ancestor was, and all of its descendants. This means that everybody who's most closely related to the single ancestral species is included in this group. This is typically how we like our um, organisms to be grouped on phylogenetic trees, but it doesn't always work out that way um, because not all of every, every single grouping will qualify as a clade. All right, so this slide has three terms. Um, here's a star on it because you need to know these terms. The first term is a monophyletic clade. This is capital C clade, the gold standard of what we're going for when we make a phylogenetic tree. So this is example A. So on this phylogenetic tree, so we'll use the same tree to, to explain both of all three of these words. A clade, remember it means it includes the most recent common ancestor and all of the descendants of that ancestor. So there's no organisms that are included in group one that aren't descendants of this ancestor, and every organism that's not a descendant is excluded. Right, so this is a monophyletic clade because it includes the most recent common ancestor of all of these individuals. B and C are not clades. Instead, these are paraphyletic groupings and polyphyletic groupings. So a paraphyletic grouping will include the common ancestor and almost all or some of the descendants. So we have D, E, and F are all descendants of this common ancestor here. But G is also a descendant and it is not included in this group. So a paraphyletic group that we common talk about is reptiles. Um, but we usually exclude birds. So if we talk about reptiles, but we don't include birds in that grouping, then we have what's called a paraphyletic group. To make reptiles a clade, we have to also involve birds that are descendants of dinosaurs. C is a polyphyletic grouping. So this is slightly different. It's going to include the descendants of a group, but it does not include the most recent common ancestor. So A, B, and C have an ancestor here, but D is also included in this group. So we have to also include this is the most recent common ancestor for A, B, C, and D. So if we're going to discuss the group concerning A, B, C, and D, but not this individual, um, then this is going to be a polyphyletic group and not a clade. Uh, we often do this with the protists. So we'll discuss protists that look similar or that we group them together for some reason, um, but we don't discuss the most recent common ancestor because the protists are all over the map. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of polyphyletic groups uh, there. So let's look at this example. If we looked at these organisms and I asked you to make a group based on similar body shapes, you might choose the seals and the whales, these cetaceans, as a group of organisms because they all live in the ocean. Um, but we know based on genetics that seals are more closely related to bears and the cetaceans are more closely related to the ungulates, um, and they're not actually very closely related to each other. So what is this? Is this monophyletic, paraphyletic, or polyphyletic? This is a polyphyletic grouping because it includes the descendants, but not the ancestor. It's not included. Here's another grouping up here. 
let's say we looked at the ungulates, but you didn't know that cetaceans are closely related to ungulates and they didn't make sense up here, so we're not gonna include them. Um, this grouping is going to include the ancestor of the even-toed ungulates because it's got the hippopotamus and the other ungulates, but we're just excluding this uh, one branch over here. So what type of grouping is this? Is this a monophyletic clade, a paraphyletic clade, or a polyphyletic clade? This is a paraphyletic group because we have the ancestor and we have some of the descendants, but not all of them. If I want to have an actual monophyletic clade, I could include the seals, the bears, and the other carnivores. Uh, that would be monophyletic because I have the most recent common ancestor and then all of the, dis the descendants. So this would be monophyletic. And this is the only one that gets a capital C clade as a term. So when we have organisms uh, in organized into these clades, we talk about them based on characteristics. So a lot of the times we're going to draw characteristics on the clade, the cladogram, um, with these vertical lines. So a shared characteristic means that Sorry, a, sh a shared characteristic means that the both groups have it. An ancestral characteristic means that it originated previously. It's ancestral. All the organisms in this group, plus other organisms in other groups, already had that characteristic. What we like to use to parse out evolutionary patterns are shared derived characters. So a lot of the times I'm going to call these characteristics. These are what we like to use to determine what groups organisms should belong in. So here are some shared derived characteristics. The vertebral column is a derived characteristic for the vertebrates, like this large group up here. When we move over here, the hinged jaws, this is gonna be a newly derived characteristic here. So organisms here are going to be the jaw um, animals that have jaws. Four limbs is a derived characteristic for the tetrapods, frogs, turtles, and leopard here. The amniotic egg is a derived characteristic for reptiles and um, mammals. And then hair is a derived characteristic uh, of only mammals. So on this tree, if I were to talk about the leopard and the turtle, and I wanted you to distinguish between them, the only way to distinguish between them is with a derived characteristic, like hair. Leopards have hair, turtles do not. If I asked you to distinguish between these based on the number of limbs, you'd be like, they both have four. Um, so the number of limbs in this case is a shared ancestral characteristic because both the leopard and the turtle have four limbs. So it's not gonna help me make distinguishing um, cladograms between these two groups. On a clada group, usually we have a single outgroup. The outgroup will typically be the one that branches off first and it's usually not the species that's being studied. The rest of the species are the in-group, and these are all of the various species that are being studied, and we like to put an out-group here to kind of show um, the most derived characteristic for that in-group. Most phylogenetic tree branches don't mean anything, so the length of a branch does not typically mean anything you only show shared characteristics. Sometimes if it specifically says the length of a tree branch can, um, it, can, it can reflect the number of genetic changes. So in this case, a longer branch 
um, is going to mean uh, more change with the shorter branches, meaning that there was less change um, since that branching point. And then other times we try to put them on a time scale for fossil records. So you can see that we've got time at the bottom here where the branch lengths change based on how much time we think happened between like this point and this point. Uh, but most of the time, the phylogenetic branch lengths are not going to mean um, anything specific. So, so far the trees we've seen have been fairly small, five or six branches, but typically we have huge phylogenetic trees with hundreds of species on them. And when we have a large data set, we have to kind of make some decisions about whether the tree we're looking at is the best tree or the best hypothesis. Um, and we use two methods. And these are both computer program methods. You wouldn't do these by hand. Maximum parsimony is the tree that requires the fewest evolutionary events. So it says that if it takes, let's say we had three different tree possibilities, one of them required two evolutionary events and the other two required three. So maximum parsonary Moni would say, well, let's go with the path of least resistance. It's more, it's more parsimonious that only two evolutionary events happened rather than requiring three evolutionary events. Um, sometimes we choose trees based on maximum likelihood, and this is based on probability rules. And it reflects um, the most likely sequence of evolutionary events. So this is commonly used when we find multiple trees with the same level of parsimony. Then we might look at maximum likelihood and say, okay, well, both of these trees required only two evolutionary events. Which one was more likely to have occurred first? So here, here's an example of three phylogenetic hypotheses for the relationship of these beetles. And this is based on genetic data from these different, um, the beetle species. So in the first tree, let's say A, we've got that species one is sister to species two. Tree B, we've got species one is sister to species three. And then tree C, we've got species three is sister to species two. So this is all of the different three possibilities of how these three species could be related to each other. When we look at the number of evolutionary events that would have had to occur based on the genetics to get these different um, outcomes, what we see is that this first relationship would have only required six events, whereas both of these would have required seven to get to those um, relationships. So A is the most parsimonious. It had the fewest evolutionary events. Um, but if this wasn't six, let's say this was seven, there was another thing here. Uh, what we would have to do is we would have to look at which one is the most likely and then choose from that information. It's extremely important to remember that a phylogenetic tree is a hypothesis. This is a best guess based on the data that we have. Morphological data, fossil data, molecular DNA data, and sometimes um, phylogenetic bracketing of hypotheses gives us a chance to look at uh, extinct or individuals. So for example, if you look at this reptilian phylogenetic tree over here, we see that birds are sister to the Saurischian dinosaurs, which uh, this grouping is now sister to the Ornithischian dinosaurs, and then all of the dinosaurs would be sister to the crocodilians. There are some common similarities that we know between crocodilians and birds. They all have four chambered hearts, they all build nests, and they all brood their young. So if that's a shared characteristic between crocodiles and birds, that probably arose somewhere back here. So it's a good guess 
that the Ornithischian dinosaurs and the Saurischian dinosaurs also probably had four-chambered hearts, built nests, and brooded their young. Um, and from what we can tell of the fossil record, we do find nest building and brooding in the dinosaurs, so that hypothesis gets supported by the physical fossil data 